Hey folks, my name is Sarah Handler and I am a product manager on Netflix's security engineering team. We are so excited to have you with us today for this panel discussion on product leadership. I'm joined by three amazing product leaders uh, that I would love to introduce you to you all. Shelly, why don't you kick us off? Hey Sarah, hello everyone. I'm Shelly Jarrett. I head product for Salesforce technology services, uh, basically responsible for making sure technology services are running for Salesforce on Salesforce. I had product teams of about 60 plus people, so fun job there. And when I'm not working, I'm spending time with my 12 year old son, running my house and spending time in national parks. Amazing, thanks for being here, Shelly. Nadine. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nadim. Um, I lead product for uh, TripAdvisor on the content business. Um, content for TripAdvisor is basically anything user facing that is not UGC. So you can think of that as articles, itineraries, recommendations, things like that. Um, I've spent about 10 months at TripAdvisor, but before that, my whole career has been in media. So I've worked at Viacom, YouTube, and Electronic Arts. Um, and when I am not working, I enjoy spending time with my eight month old daughter, um, as well as playing video games, watching TV, hiking, um, and basically spending time with friends. Amazing, and Josh. Hey everyone, I'm Josh. I'm a group product manager at Atlassian, working on Jira software. My team covers a lot of things, but the ones that are very prominent and probably well known are the board and the backlog areas of the product. Um, and when I am not working, I love being out in nature, whether it's hiking or skiing. And I apologize, I'm taking this from the car, but I'm actually on a ski trip right now um, and don't have good Wi Fi. So I had to get somewhere where I could have some connectivity. Amazing. Well, thank you for being with us today. We have a number of questions for these panelists, but we also want to hear from you. So please feel free to add some questions to the comments. Today, we're going to start with a question for Josh. So Josh, tell us a little bit about how you think about managing expectations with your team. Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's really important for everyone on the team to understand what they are driving towards. Um, I think it is really easy for people to kind of implicitly in their head just fill in the vacuum of like non-information. And so I think setting really clear expectations and the more junior someone is on the team, I think it is more important to set that more clearly. I think as someone gets up in seniority, if you're imagining like a staff or principal PM, like, you know, it's not that they don't have expectations, but there's a lot more that they understand that they are capable of kind of filling in the blanks and then filling in the blanks as value. So I think it kind of scales out from like an intern PM all the way up to that principal PM. I think the other part about it is making it very clear the expectations of those adjacent to them. So, hey, you're responsible for this part, but this other person that works in the area that's next to you is responsible for this. Um, and there's, in my view, always going to be some amount of overlap and that's okay, but you need people to be aware of that. Otherwise, there can be either too much clashing or gaps between them. Um, and then I would say, and this is depends more on the organization. I've worked at a bunch of different companies, but sometimes it can be important to clarify, particularly when someone's new at the company, of just what the expectations of PM itself is. Like PM is a pretty flexible role. And at different companies, for example, like there might be more user research elements or more data analysis elements. And at some companies, there's a lot less of that. And so I think that's a key one to set, not all the time, but is particularly important when someone's coming in from a different company. So I will, plenty more Definitely. to say. That's kind of, I think, the ones that I think of the most and all the time. Definitely, that really resonates. Nadeem, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I pretty much agree with everything Jack said. I also think it's important to define roles well when you're creating uh, a job description. I've seen really, a lot of scenarios where multiple PMs get hired into a team where the roles are a, a bit fuzzy and it feels like PMs are kind of jostling for like what products they own. And that just results in a lot of conflict within a team. Um, so I think it's something that I think not a lot of hiring managers spend a lot of time thinking about, but should probably spend more time thinking about it because when a PM comes in with a very clear set of these are the things that I own and these are the things that I don't own, it becomes a lot easier for the team to gel and to be more effective. 
Definitely. We know that intentions can be good, but sometimes that does not happen ahead of time. Do you have any thoughts for teams who might be in that position where PMs are kind of jostling for scope or understanding their role? Yeah, I think it's um, it's really something that the manager needs to uh, clear up because at the end of the day, the manager is the person who put out the job description and they hired these people in and they probably had in their head a set of responsibilities for each of these folks. And so leaving it up to the PMs to kind of fight it out, I think is never gonna end well. It really is up to the manager to kind of set those expectations clearly. Um, what I've had work in the past is to create um, a RACI document, which is you know responsive, uh, a list of different tasks or areas of expertise, and then the people who are responsible, accountable, consulted and informed, and, that, and then just have a meeting where everyone sits down and talks about that. And that makes it very clear to people what each person is doing and what each person is responsible for. Definitely, we love a good racy. I think PMs can be the uh, superpower of clarity and that's a very helpful tool. Now, you mentioned a little bit around if there's not clarity on who's doing what or what the PM role is, it can be a big challenge. And there's lots of challenges when it comes to driving impact for our product teams. And so I'm curious, I'll just toss it back to you, Josh. What's been the hardest challenge for you so far in driving impact for your product teams? Yeah, I'd say there's there's always lots of challenges, but the one that's been most consistent is when the team meaningfully changes what they're working on. Like they were working on one KR and now they have a different one in nature. And there's just this kind of like, like late, latency or almost like kind of like stickiness where people's mind is still on the other one. And you see this thing where people, they really understand that customer problem or set of customer problems, they've empathized with it. You're now trying to move the team on to the next thing and people's minds just kind of almost go to repurposing. Like, oh, that those problems that I heard about, like I can associate them with that new key result that we're trying to drive. And it takes quite a bit of mental energy for people to like shift their gears. And so I've seen this thing consistently over time where um, the more space you can create for people, like so that they can kind of reset their brain, the better they are able to set themselves up for impact. Otherwise, you kind of end up with this like month or two with this kind of like awkward transition. Um, and like the broader form of this, I want to say is like over overly narrow empathy, where they're really set on set at creating impact for some set of users for some set of problem, but not necessarily the right set of users, the broad enough set of users, or the the KR that we have at hand. Definitely. It is uh, for many teams annual planning season. So I'm sure OKRs are top of mind. Um, Shelly, I'm curious whether for you OKRs have been a helpful tool in driving impact or do you see any challenges when it comes to articulating the outcomes that your teams are trying to drive? Yes, um, all the time, especially as you scale the team and if you're working for product for an enterprise organization, like that's, uh, that's I think, a constant problem we are trying to solve. At Salesforce, what we have something, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, we do more, right? That's our annual planning similar to the, the goals that we set. It's our vision, values, and what are the objectives for the year. And it's it's a constant uh uh, it's it's a live document, right? Dynamics, so we're updating that. Uh, we use that. I think the biggest challenge uh, we have uh, when you scale teams is uh, prioritization of work, right? Like there's so many stakeholders and you have this roadmap you want to do, but you've been at that, like there's things coming at from different directions. Now there's AI, right? Gen AI, everybody wants to do Gen AI. Uh, but there are some mission critical stuff that we also need to do on the roadmap stuff that we plan for stuff for user experience for employee experience and other areas that the PMs have already uh, kind of planned for the product there's tech debt that comes in so there's, there's a whole slew of things that you constantly need to prioritize and drive and then that's when it should, becomes harder to show impact and that's why I think the product role is so critical is staying focused on what matters most for that business, right? What is our main North Star? Are we driving towards it? Are we just running after the next shiny object? Is it going to get us closer? Like, what is that North Star? And being sure to drive that impact. Of course, that means sometimes dropping the roadmap, right? Like we were working on certain things before COVID and COVID hit and it's like, okay, now the 
the strategy has changed, the market has changed, right? Virtual collaboration, work from anywhere is probably a priority. Now, digital marketing is even more important than anything else. So you have to shift your priorities and that having a constant framework for prioritization has been helpful for me as I scale my team. So uh, definitely a big proponent of using OKRs to drive impact, we do moms, whatever you may call it in your company enterprise. But definitely we need to have those clear quarterly goals and making sure the teams are marching towards that and at the same time having that fine balance to be agile and pay with the strategy if required. You mentioned having to pivot, which is something I think we've all have to do, especially over the last few years. That can be a very emotional team for PMs on your teams, for the engineering teams, and there's a lot of sunk cost in existing work or people are really emotionally attached to a roadmap. Uh, because we're so close to users, right? We want to do what's best for our users. How do you handle those situations where you're really having to lead your team in a new direction and there might be some resistance in this pivot? Yes, uh, people, not just PMs, we have our engineers, our delivery teams, also really, really passionate about a certain stuff technology or certain solution we are doing slack there's a lot of passion around slack like how things should be done how should it should be rolled out everybody has uh you know ideas to solve towards that but uh it's again coming down to that prioritization and having everybody align on the business objectives and what is adding value so in my team uh we have a framework for prioritization of business value right so it's a weighted scorecard that we all use um and it starts from the PO, which is like at the pod level, and then it goes up to a PM, and then the pod le- product line, and then the, the director and the group product manager. It's a similar framework where we weigh it based on what is the business objective, how much does it help save costs, how many users, whatever, whatever the KPIs may be for that product, right? So you weigh it according to that, and then you have objective discussion. And then when you have that prioritization clear with the team, it makes it very clear to stakeholders, to your business partners, to your team that's executing on that strategy. Um, and kind of helps get some of that emotion out of it. Like it's you're not personally attached to that objective, but this is what it's helping us give value. Value could be in terms of money, value could be in terms of users or growth, whatever that KPI may be. But it gives us a scored mechanism, a data-driven way of prioritizing work and having that alignment. So right now we are an org of about 700 to 800 engineers. Uh, so if you're talking about emotions, everybody feels certain, like emotionally attached about certain things we should do. But this, this having this framework right from um, the Scrum team, right up to the software development group helps everybody align on that priority. And all the teams, all the PMs are kind of understanding what you're working on prioritizing in a similar fashion. Definitely. I think being clear on prioritization and how you are prioritizing is so important, right? Inherent in this role is making hard decisions. And with that can come disagreements, right? You can have the most beautiful framework, but you may have disagreements with your stakeholders on what direction we're heading. Nadeem, I'd love to hear from you on how you've handled conflict with your stakeholders when you disagree on roadmap or prioritization decisions. Yeah, definitely. It's something that um, comes up often when you're making these kinds of decisions. Um, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that different teams have different priorities um, and often those priorities will conflict. So for example, in my role at TripAdvisor, I work with a lot of very traditional software teams like engineering, design, research, but I also work with a lot of creative teams like editorial, marketing, um, brand, et cetera. And the priorities for those teams are very different to the priorities of the engineering and design teams. Um, often, you know, the engineering teams care about LOE and scoping and roadmap and, and that kind of stuff, whereas the, the creative teams care more about brand and, and what does this say about TripAdvisor and what's our voice and things like that, and things can come into conflict. What I found helpful in those situations is really getting a really good handle on what each team cares about and what their goals are. Um, and I do that through weekly and biweekly meetings with those teams where I really build empathy, I guess is is the answer, building empathy with those teams. And then eventually when you have a roadmap that you know a team is gonna disagree with or or a feature that a team is gonna disagree with, going to them early and just explaining to them why this is important to the business, why the decision was made and acknowledging that you know that they're gonna disagree with the approach, but here's why we're doing it, that, that tends to diffuse the situation. They're still gonna have some pushback, but they at least feel seen and heard and. Um, in my experience, that's helped me 
get some pretty difficult uh, projects pushed through. You know, I'm curious, you mentioned having you know, these touch points with the individuals from your various stakeholder teams. I'm curious, as you scale teams, as you grow in your product leadership, how you've been able to maintain that? What does that look like when at a certain point you just run out of hours in the day to have these you know, perhaps regular touch points with some of your stakeholders? How have you scaled that? Yeah, I think I've, I've done two things. The first is to like have direct touch points with one or two folks per team. Um, and usually it's the people who I think are either the decision makers or are kind of like the more influential team members within that team. Um, and having that personal relationship has been helpful for two-way communication. I can communicate to them what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about and vice versa. But also having a bigger forum where all the teams come together and share what they're doing. So uh, we used to have a weekly meeting where the, the general manager of the content business would organize a meeting that every single team that touches content meets every week to kind of share their updates, um, talk about what's coming up next, and then other team members can kind of jump in and say, hey, you know, I haven't heard about this. How are we handling this? Have you thought about this issue? Um, and having those big forums really helps bring a lot of uh, questions that you might not have thought of as you are thinking through a roadmap or thinking through a project. Um, so I think it's a combination of like picking tactically who you want to speak to and have a one-to-one -one relationship versus having a larger forum where multiple stakeholders are present. Definitely. It sounds like a variety of tactics to reach your stakeholders. Shelly, I think you have some ideas and experience in this realm as well we'd love to share. Yes, uh, I think it also depends on the type of product you're doing. Like when you're doing product for a smaller company, a startup, it's, you know, you're wearing multiple hats and you're doing all these discussions. Uh, sometimes it's working for bigger teams and it's like, how do you scale? How do you clone yourself, right? So if you are having this, you could be a great product manager yourself and run the sprint. But if it's a marathon, it's like, how do you uh, have multiple versions of your similar self, similar product managers? Of course, you want diversity as well of thought. Uh, but uh, I started my product team, uh, we were three product managers uh, and we were a very small organization, but we went through this hyper growth phase uh, where now like we went from three to 10 to 20 to 25 to 30, now we are at 60. So it was not overnight, but it's been a, like, you know, a, a exponential growth, but it was like, how do I replicate the same behavior, like the feedback I got from my stakeholders and business partners, where it works, it works where they're really awesome people, but how do you have the same bar for everyone? How do you have same, you know, skills and rituals across the board? So those things become very important when you're thinking about scaling, like how do you have consistency? What are the rituals you want your team to follow? Uh, what are the agile practices you want your team to follow? So having that upfront, so it's like when you go from one to two to three, start, start that practice and start putting those documents down. I think structure is very important and also being agile in that structure. Uh, I know framework sometimes it's like agile manifesto says, interactions over people be fluid but you also have to as as you grow as a product leader especially in this topic when you're talking about scaling teams thinking about having those frameworks those flywheels that you can give uh, for example so i took the best habits of some what of some of my best pms were doing so hey this one runs prioritization very well this one does customer engagements very well this one has the, the task management uh, which is Jira, the equivalent of Jira, Josh, we have our own uh, Salesforce tool that we use, but Jira and task management, right? How somebody's doing that well. So taking all of that and having like a, a run book of, okay, these are 10 things that every PM needs to be doing on a constant basis and having that as a scorecard or as a flywheel helps us maintain that bar. Like everybody's running a prioritization session every month everybody's updating the roadmap every month everybody is updating their guts in a similar fashion uh, so yes it leads to like we don't want to get into the how we do want those teams to solve the how but as you grow thinking about that upfront is very very helpful like what are the practices the rituals you want your teams to follow that's a great point on the rituals and having some consistency with them you know, I think one thing that some folks joining us today may be wondering, or maybe they're at this point in their career where they're moving from these individual contributor product roles to formal product leadership, 
And that can be a tough transition, right? Because you're no longer just responsible for your own work. You're really responsible for your team and generally the product more broadly. Josh, what sort of advice do you have for product people at that stage in their career where they're moving into product leadership? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as someone who has you know helped people on my team make that transition before, I think I would say, um, please work with your existing manager to like, get the reps in on the team that you're currently on. I think one of the best ways to get started is to basically effectively be the pseudo lead for like intern PMs or APMs or new grad PMs um, and take it as more than just a form of mentorship. So to kind of echo part of what Nadim said before, a big part of being a good PM leader is about setting up that, that scope of ownership about the, those streams. And so that is something that I think as a senior ICPM that is going to move into leadership, that you ought to be able to partner with your current lead and like take the point on that for an intern or an APM. And I think that's one of the best ways to learn because it is something that is so different than IC work. The second piece of advice that I would give is understanding that at the end of the day, um, you need to let people fail it's really hard to stomach this sometimes. And you need to understand in what situations and to what degree they can fail, right? You don't want them failing so bad that it's negatively impacting the business, but they do need to be able to fail to the degree that they learn. And there's no perfect answer to that. It depends on the situation, but you need to keep that in mind because I can say as a new manager, I certainly struggled with that many years ago. I've seen new managers struggle with it. Um, I'm sure everyone else here has other great thoughts, but those are the two that are just so different than being an IC. Uh, it's really important to internalize those. Mm. I love that call out on leaving space for failure and kind of knowing for your team what is rubber and what is glass that if it drops will become a big problem. The team, I'm curious, you know, on your teams that you have led, how did you deal with that transition? Yeah, so I, I agree with what Josh said, and I remember attending a, a talk by Ted Sarandos where he basically said that um, from Netflix, and he said that um, when he when he is thinking about how he lets his teams kind of work, he generally agrees with eighty percent of what they do, and then he disagrees with twenty percent of what they do. But he generally like lets them kind of do things their way, and I think that that's part of it. Um, I think failure is obviously a great way to learn and, and figure out what not to do, and that becomes really important uh, going forward. But then touching on on what Shelley said earlier. It's like finding ways to clone yourself and kind of multiply your impact. Uh, and that really comes from identifying what parts of your workload you can um, offload to someone else and that you're comfortable offloading. And then what parts are so critical and have to be done correctly that you need to be involved. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do it yourself, but at least have many touch points. So maybe, you know, you give a critical task. Um, to someone you're working with, but then you have weekly check-ins to ensure that they're on track, right? And so it's a different form of prioritization. It's prioritizing tasks versus features, um, but prioritization in general is a PM skill. And so I think identifying where you need to step in versus where you can let others lead is, is a really good skill. Definitely. I know, Shelly, you also have this experience, right, of moving from these individual contributor roles into product leadership. Has your experience been the same or have there been other lessons that you've learned from that experience? No, I've had a very interesting experience. I remember going through product school videos and stuff. I was an engineer, a software developer, I see, and I was like looking to get in, like, what is my next thing, right? Like, what is it that I enjoy? I did software development, managed some teams there. I did architecture, but it was like, okay, I wasn't enjoying this. Hit on to product school, self-taught product, and moved into product. I formed this team ground up. Um, I've had three promotions in four years now, uh, which Amy Weaver tells me might be a record as his was, but we'll check those facts later. Uh, but uh, it's not, uh, I think the mistake I was making was chasing titles and chasing like, I have to be a manager. I have to be a manager to do this, right? I have to get this title to do this job. Um, 
leadership is not about managing people i think that's a mistake we made leadership is strategic leadership it could be in different forms like josh said it could be in mentoring and how do you not just stay in your swim lane but how are you looking at the product suite holistically what is the business strategy are you helping contribute towards that i think sometimes people get so hung up on manager title and my swim lane like i get so many questions like oh i am going above and beyond in my job why am i not being promoted to a manager why am i not getting a promotion it's like there are three pillars to growth right yes there is your performance but there is also potential and there's a business need like where is the business need for this people manager right like find identify those and go chase those down so the biggest advice i give is treat your your awesome product managers treat your career like a product right think about it that way like where are the areas what are the strategy where should you prioritize time what other areas you should lean in more some people do an awesome job of just refining and reiterating something but it's like Did that help the business? Like, how much revenue did that bring? How many users did that bring? What is the final impact? People lose sight of that. So, definitely treating your career like a product itself. And the second biggest thing is ask. If you don't ask, the answer will always be no. Um, so, ask to have these conversations with your managers, with your leaders in your organization. Like for me, I'm always looking for awesome like leaders because I I want to delegate and I I have so many things on my plate. I would love to have somebody who can come and help me and like same thing with my directors and my team. They are all we are always on the hunt for people managers who can come and lead teams. We the the I think we find very awesome ICPMs, but that shift of treating even your teams like you know like you think about product empathy having that you know design think mindset is very very helpful i love your comment around basically pm in your career right treating mm-hmm. that like a product and formal people leadership may not be for every pm but you can still be an incredibly effective product leader Yeah, I think you know a number of the folks who can benefit from product school uh, opportunities like this are really early in their career, right? Maybe you're a fresh PM who just entered this field, but you aspire to be an effective leader in your organization. Josh, I'd love to hear from you. What sort of advice do you give to those really early in career PMs about how they should be thinking about growing their leadership? Yeah, I think one of the top things that I would say here is. Listen a lot. Um, you're going to be increasingly pulled into meetings with more senior people. Listen to how the discussion flows about what people are asking and how people are answering. I think one of the quite common kind of learning areas for more junior PMs as they're growing is how do you answer at the right level of of altitude? It's very common for you PMs you're talking about like a specific feature, but kind of To Shelley's point before about like the strategic aspect, is get comfortable with answering more abstractly. There, there needs to be a concrete piece there, but it does not mean that you're always talking at like the feature level, the spec level, which is really important when you're getting started. Um, so that's I think piece number one I would give. the The second piece I would I would really give here is understand the different audiences like you should already have experience with that when you talk to engineers versus designers it's going to be very different when you are spending more time with more senior folks in the organization their minds are often occupied by very different spaces and understanding how to communicate this basically the same set of things to very different groups is important and it should be a skill that you've developed but now you need to deploy it in a different way That's really good advice. I think we have time for one more question today. So our final question for today for our panelists that we have is around what sort of strategies we have as you scale your product management team. So I'd love to hear from Nadeem on what strategies have you used to successfully maintain team cohesion and alignment as your team has scaled. Yeah, my position is interesting because my last two jobs have been fully virtual. In the sense that, like, I don't think I've actually met. Sorry, my last three jobs have been fully, fully virtual. I haven't met anyone <laughs> in person in my last three jobs, um, and I think that's becoming more and more common. And it becomes really hard to kind of build team cohesion, team spirit when you're not seeing people on a daily basis, getting lunch with them, hanging out with them in the in the hallway. 
Um, so one thing that I found has been really helpful is obviously having the occasional on-site where people fly in, get to meet each other, have, have social events. Um, but then just having like a weekly so 30 minute like social session where you log on with the team members, you're not talking about work, you're just talking about your personal life. Um, and it sounds really simple, but it, it's added like a lot of dimension to like your relationships with other, other team members. Um, and I feel like it's made people more collaborative. It's made people more likely to ask for help or be vulnerable. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that you lose in a fully virtual uh, environment. So a bit unique to maybe, you know, these fully virtual roles, I think. Um, but it's something that's worked really well for me. Definitely. Yeah, I think the virtual world that we live in with many jobs is not going back. So learning how to thrive within that is important. Shelly, what about you? Uh, I think you might be muted. Sorry, it could be unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we have similar challenges. We have virtual teams, we have hybrid teams, we have global teams, we have teams in India, Dublin, all across the world. Uh, so, and as we are scaling, this is definitely something that we want to keep in mind. Uh, so having shared visions and values, I think that goes a long way and constantly reiterating that that's not something just for the wall, but you know, operationalizing those uh, and having those regular checkpoints, one-on-ones, uh, meetings, gatherings, having those offline conversations, and I'll go back to my rituals uh, again, right? Having those constant rituals and everybody knows what the ritual means. Everybody knows uh, what, when it, and when to expect it, plan for it. And if, you know, uh, we have the similar ritual follow right from like the SVP down to the manager in the organization. So we have that shared uh, culture of similar visions. So anyone you interact to in our team will be like, you know, having those, the same leadership qualities. So I think that goes a long way in kind of investing time in your values and visions and operationalizing those. Mm. I love that focus on values and the rituals. Uh, Josh, our last comment for today, what do you think about this in terms of maintaining team cohesion? Yeah, someone who also works at a totally remote company, uh, I have to echo everyone of getting people together occasionally is, is absolutely essential. Like I, I think everything else has to layer on top of like, it is really hard if you've not actually seen someone in the flesh. There's just this trust, like instinctive trust. It does not mean you need to do it daily or weekly or monthly, but at some rate. Um, I think another part about it is really leaning into, particularly with global teams, uh, asynchronous communication and making that valued. I think that like, uh, the company, I'm, I'm based in New Zealand, despite the accent. We've got people in Australia. We've got people in the U.S. that we regularly work with. That spans a ton of time zones. Um, and if, but most of the teams in Australia, and so it's very easy for synchronous communication to become like treated as more, more the way of working. And it's really important to impress upon people that like that's a way to work. But you need to give asynchronous communication, whether it's over Slack with long delays or like comments on Confluence docs, and you need to really normalize that. And so I make a point. But for example, even though I could jump on a Zoom call with someone, engaging in communications that are, for example, more friendly for someone on the East Coast of the US and the East Coast of Australia to be having that kind of asynchronous communication. And I think that that, that leveling of it is really important to creating cohesion. That's a great point. Yes, async communication is super critical. Thank you to all of our panelists for this amazing insight in product leadership. And I appreciate everyone tuning in today. Have a good one. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah.